Um, uh, very happy to have with us um, uh, Dr. Sid Seiler. Uh, <coughs> um, Sid is a good friend, uh, both personal and an academic colleague. Um, and I want to properly introduce him for all of our guests here uh, because he doesn't get out much <laughs> <laughs> in his line of work. So. Um, uh, Dr. Seiler is the director for Korea in the White House National Security Council. Um, he is one of the most uh, authoritative experts uh, on Korea, on both Koreas in the current administration. Uh, for the past 30 years, he has worked in multiple intelligence disciplines, including the National Security Agency, the Directorate of Intelligence, Directorate of Operations in the CIA, and the Foreign Broadcast Information Service. He spent 12 of those years in South Korea. He previously served as Deputy Director of National uh, Deputy Director of National Intelligence Manager for North Korea, having joined the service when it was established in January 2006. Prior to the DNI, he served with the National Clandestine Service of the CIA. He's, a, he's the author of a very good book, uh, Kim Il-sung, 1941 to 48, The Creation of a Legend, The Building of a Regime. I read that book in doing the research for The Impossible State, my own book, and cite it quite a bit in that book. Um, Dr. Seiler received his MA in Korean Studies from Yonsei University's Graduate School of International Studies. He's a graduate of the Korean Language Programs at DLI and Yonsei University, uh, and did his undergraduate at the University of Maryland. So Sid, it's really a pleasure to have you with us today. Uh, we will proceed as follows. Um, Dr. Seiler will have some comments to start us off, um, then we'll have a bit of discussion, and then we'll open it just for a couple of questions. Uh, in spite of this uh, terrible weather, while the rest of us will probably be going home after this, he's going back to work. He's got a full day. So, uh, Sid, over to you. Thank you for that, that kind introduction, Victor. I thought I'd uh, take an opportunity to build upon some of the excellent discussions we had this morning to kind of look at uh, the alliance going forward uh, within the context of largely two broad uh, areas. First of all, what we see with the evolving uh, North Korea threat its implications for the alliance in its next uh, 60 years, and what we've already begun to do to, to, uh, to meet that threat, to deal with that threat, uh, and to lay a course for future uh, cooperation to build upon the great work that uh, uh, these three former commanders of U.S. Forces Korea, Combined Forces Command, have talked about. Uh, you know, the... The last five years have witnessed, uh, I think, a, a sea change in the uh, environment on the Korea Peninsula. Uh, it overlaps uh, with the administration of President Obama. It, it uh, overlaps with the period, if one would say, the since we last had a, a meaningful six-party talks discussion. And I think it, it, it reflects a transformation of North Korea that had been long planned but came about uh, both in terms of capabilities and clarity of intentions. It's important to remember in, in uh, January of 2009 when President Obama was inaugurated with an offer to, to uh, raise out a hand to those who would unclinch their fist that the North Koreans uh, shortly thereafter responded by making preparations for a, a missile test. Uh, Tape Odong 2 launch that would lead to a, a, a presidential statement out of the United Nations Security Council, which itself would then lead to North Korea's second nuclear test, their first one having been in 2006. And after the diplomatic dust settled and, and uh, Special Representative Steve Bosworth went to Pyongyang in December of 2009, uh, in 2010, North Korea turned its attention towards uh, the Republic of Korea, toward the South, and then in 2010, as everybody remembers, we had the sinking of the ROK Corvette, the Chonan, in March, and of course, the shelling of Yunpyeong Island literally under an hour after I had flown over it with Ambassador Bosworth on our way to China to talk about the North's revelation of its uranium enrichment program. Three lessons really emerged from these two years. First of all, on the security side, when you think about the events, nuclear tests, missile launch, sinking of a, a rock Navy vessel, shelling of an island, 
uh, the USROK alliance demonstrated its resilience and grew stronger. Deterrence was secured. Deterrence was secured. And in the process, Koreans, South Koreans, and people in the region were reassured, in large part because of the strength of the USROK relationship, Seoul-Washington cooperation in responding to these uh, events. And the lesson on the diplomacy side just began to emerge. For the first time in, in, in many years, the traditional cycle of provoke, rush back to the table, provoke, gain concessions from denuclearization dialogue that gave the appearance of forward progress, but in retrospect, it was only an appearance. That, that cycle was broken. Pyongyang was taught in the 2009 and 2010 period that it will receive nothing from threats and provocations, only further diplomatic and economic isolation. Its effort to drive a wedge between Seoul and Washington, its so-called Tongmi Bongnam strategy, its, its effort to influence internal politics in the Republic of Korea, its efforts to weaken the Republic of Korea's North Korea strategy, all failed. North Korea began to learn that its bad behavior will no longer be rewarded. At 60 years old, the alliance simply was too smart and too wise for that. The third lesson, though, that I'd like to take away and kind of focus on this, because of what it says about the threat, was the analytical lessons. Here I kind of risk taking off my current policymaker hat, going back to my old analyst days. But you know, there's, there's three real significant lessons learned from these events that I think will have implications for years to come. First of all, with the May 25th nuclear test, North Korea, its second nuclear test, closed the book on the question, does North Korea really intend to acquire a nuclear weapons capability, or is it simply pursuing nuclear capabilities to gain the attention of the United States and the world in order to engage it to build and deliver it to the United States? And of course, to do so under the cover of satellite launches, hence, their repeated attempts to try to check the so-called boxes in what they claim to be a peaceful, uh, legitimate, sovereign right of the DPRK to engage in space launches, in spite of United Nations Security Council resolutions to the contrary. And then finally, the Chunan and Yunpyeong Island incidents both demonstrated that North Korea intended to continue to use uh, provocations, kinetic, even at times lethal, as uh, a coercive diplomatic tool of intimidation and violence. And as uh, General Sharp and later General Thurman had to, to come to grips with this uh, counter-provocation challenge, this had a profound impact on the alliance as well. None of these three conclusions were particularly new or surprising. Many analysts had long said North Korea was not kidding when it said it was going to pursue a, North, a nuclear capability, that its Taepodong 2 was intended to be the delivery mechanism for it, and North Korea's provocations were nothing new to anybody who's watched the peninsula for 60 years. But I do believe that uh, the, the clarity with which they have now become the defining elements of the North Korea threat, the conventional threat still there, 5027-like scenarios, the possibility of unification through force, uh, all remain there on the table. But what we've seen is an evolution of some new capabilities and new intentions that the, uh, the alliance would have to respond to. And I'll go through these one by one uh, in reverse order. First, in terms of provocations as a tool of coercive diplomacy, this really demonstrated, first of all, the, the importance of, of, of solid deterrence to, to deter these types of actions, but perhaps even equally so, close, integrated, real-time US ROK cooperation. I really like what Gen General Tolelli mentioned earlier in, in that challenge of gaining a shared situational awareness. Uh, any two or three people gathered in the room watching a single event have, have different, different ways in which they perceive it, how much even more so when you have two large countries, even as integrated as we are looking at developments in a country as, as opaque as North Korea, coming to a shared understanding, a shared assessment, and a shared, uh, shared conclusion of how to respond. 
the incidents of 2010 really emphasized for the alliance, and this is a context in which we pursued uh, the counter-provocation plan, which in March 2013 was brought to a conclusion. Here we have the two sides, mechanisms in place, capabilities in place, and more important, ongoing planning that, that gives us you know, a, uh, an extra advantage, it's a force multiplier to have the, the experience on the ground with North Korea for now 60 years in armistice, but the experience working together to respond to su such type of provocations, where North Korea's intent is prov provoke and our intent is to respond uh, accordingly. The U.S. commitment here, I should add, can never be any clearer. Ambassador Rice mentioned this in her speech recently in November at Georgetown, that there will be significant costs to future provocations by North Korea. Pyongyang has a choice, continue to pursue this path and encounter greater isolation and crippling economic privation, or take a new path and find a true chance for peace, development, and global integration. The, the evolving uh, missile threat is another area in which the alliance has had to work together more closely uh, to counter a threat that I remember when I first went to Korea in 1982, it was three rockets over ground, frogs. And I remember we used to say, you know, jokingly, we all were hoping that we were the target of the three rocket over ground because their accuracy was so poor, it'd be certain not to be hit. <laughs> it's kind of a flippant way, but that's what, you know, privates talk about when they're young and inexperienced. But the, uh, the emerging North Korea missile threat is real. And General Thurman mentioned the long-range artillery, which has also always been a an existing threat to the, the Seoul metropolitan area. With North Korea's pursuit of missile capabilities, we even more the peninsula and even larger numbers come under threat. And this was a context in which the alliance met this challenge with the revision to the new missile guidelines. Uh, in 2012, we came to an agreement, we've now called the revised missile guidelines, which allows the ROK to, to develop new ballistic missiles up to, up to 800 kilometers in range. It committed to improved intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance capabilities. So if you're going to shoot at a target, you got to know where it is and what it is. Uh, it, it included enhancements to our, our working together, command and control, so that when we face the situation in which we have to use these capabilities, we do so deliberately and smartly. We are developing, and we will continue to develop, a comprehensive alliance approach to the North Korea missile threat. This is key, this is crucial, uh, given its, its evolution. And then finally, on the nuclear side, I think there's four, I, I see four overlapping yet reinforcing lines of effort in how we deal with this North Korean nuclear capability. The first, the first is denying, denying Pyongyang the benefits of no, nuclear coercion. I think the most immediate threat that we face, obviously, is that on any given day, uh, a, a North Korea provocation, whether it be some type of asymmetrical uh, provocation or a conventional provocation, always has in the background that concern, that fear, and North Korea knows that. And the way to stand up to the bully in the, in the, in the, on the playground who has this capability or alleged capability in, in his back pocket is to have transparent and seamless coordination like we do in the U.S. ROK Alliance. Real-time, close cooperation so that when we get into this period, any period of heightened tensions, there's no splitting of the alliance, we deal with it smartly, and the value to Pyongyang of this nuclear coercion is, uh, is strongly diminished. Firm but calm responses. Remember, the word provoke is designed, it, it means to elicit a desired response from your counterpart. The best way to deny North Korea the value of provocations is to not respond in the manner that they're hoping to get you to respond in. And that's where close U.S. and ROK cooperation at all periods of, of the provocation cycle is, is so crucial. No rewarding bad behavior. I talked about that earlier, so I won't dwell on it, but don't underestimate the value of, of even these, these, these diplomatic areas of having strong value in, uh, in, in encountering the North Korea nuclear deterrent. And then finally, to inflict political and economic cost on North Korea for refusing to denuclearize. It, it takes away, you know, some, some friends of mine 
when we get in discussions, frank discussions, you know, they say, you know, aren't we, aren't we in essence, you know, being outfoxed and outmaneuvered by, by North Korea? And I would just say, well, you know, nuclear and missile capabilities aside, look at the diplomatic isolation, look at the economic isolation, look at the number of countries who joined in condemnation of the third nuclear test. Look at the support that we get in the United Nations Security Council after each and every missile launch and each and every nuclear test, resolution after resolution. So in addition to denying disrupting, now when it comes to disrupting the progress of the North's nuclear program, the United States uses a range of national and multilateral sanctions. These sanctions target North Korean WMD entities, and they're designed to curtail profits from weapons exports and access to critical technologies and components abroad. These have had the effect of slowing the growth of the program. Uh, and they will continue to be critical in impeding both the qualitative and quantitative growth of these capabilities that North Korea seeks. Uh, deterring. Deterring is another way we counter this capability. Now, we talked briefly uh, in the last session about the tailored deterrence strategy and the importance of extended deterrence. You know, I quote from the communique for the 44th SCM held in October, where Secretary Hagel reaffirmed the continued U.S. commitment to provide and strengthen extended deterrence for the Republic of Korea, using the full range of military capabilities, including the U.S. nuclear umbrella, conventional strike, and missile defense capabilities. There's two phrases here to focus on, full range and United States. Full range. United States. I don't think there's really much more to say as far as deterrence. I mean, you will get no better guarantee that we are prepared to meet the threat posed by North Korea and its, its, its evolving nuclear missile capabilities than what is represented by the wording and the tailored deterrence strategy, what is represented by extended deterrence, full range of the United States capabilities. And then finally, our, our fourth element of our efforts against the North Korean nuclear program or what we do in the denuclearization diplomacy realm. Uh, you know, we, in our pursuit of denuclearization under the six-party talks umbrella, in other words, all the diplomacy we do with the People's Republic of China, with Russia, with Japan, Republic of Korea, all in accordance with the principles and spirit of September 19, 2005 statement, work to negate and reduce uh, and deter the North Korean nuclear threat. Our work with China in particular has demonstrated that it, as well as all five, all of the other four parties, three parties, subtracting North Korea, all of us are opposed to a nuclear North Korea. All of us are committed to denuclearization on the, North, on, the, on the peninsula. Multilateral diplomacy has built a strong consensus and will continue to do so going forward. Life for North Korea will not get easier as it tries to pursue its so-called Byungjin policy, its, its policy of pursuing in tandem both economic development and expansion of its nuclear forces. My, co my colleague Glenn Davies, during one of our recent trips to the reason, called Byungjin a dead end, and I'd like to reinforce that today. North Korea is learning from the United States, Republic of Korea, and, the, and indeed the entire dip diplomatic international community that it will not have its cake and eat it too. So that's broadly uh, the way we're dealing, I think, within the context of the United States ROK relationship with these new threats that we're facing from North Korea. Uh, North Korea will continue to, to test us. North Korea will continue to push the limits. Uh, a lot of these cycles, we go in and out of these so-called provocation cycles and charm offensives. We've seen them before, and as I mentioned to a few of you uh, during the break, you know, it is not a trivial throwaway talking point that we use when we say, we will judge North Korea by its actions and not by its words. And when we do so, when we continue to have the close cooperation that we've demonstrated through, this, through these last five years as the North Korea's uh, program has developed and its behavior has been, you know, so unpredictable, is that a strong U.S. ROK alliance continues to be the best deterrent to the threat that is growing and posed by the North. And with that, I think maybe some questions. Great, or, great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Um, um, uh, we have a few minutes for questions. Let me just start us off before we go to the audience, um, Sid. Um, uh, I don't think there's any argument that um, sort of in this administration, you're the guy, right? You're the guy who knows the most about Korea. And um, past five years, you've been sort of doing it at the higher policy making level. I'd like to ask you to put your analyst hat on mm. and um, tell us, you know, what you, to the extent that you can in this audience, what do you think is going on there right now? I mean, with all the internal churn and obviously Chang Sung Tech and then before him, Lee Young Ho, you know, what do you think is going on there? Is, is, is everybody calls it power consolidation, but is this a path to stability or is it a path to instability? Well, Victor, if, if the, the social sciences, politics, economics, you know, uh, foreign relations, international relations could be that, that good at predictive analysis, we'd all be rich on the stock market and we'd probably have a much more peaceful world. But, uh, you know, let me talk about, there's, since Kim Jong-un came in to, uh, to take his positions at his father's death some two years ago, uh, you know, I urge people to look at, at the continuity in North Korean behavior, particularly the strategic continuity. Sure, there's, there's some, uh, you know, North Korea has always employed the element of surprise in its actions and behavior. And therefore, uh, you could almost say North Korea is always just predictably unpredictable. Uh, but at the same time, there's, there's no particular elements of North Korea's behavior that are entirely out of character with, the, with the, the historical precedents so that, you know, there's nuanced differences. There might be some differences in style. One person likes, you know, joint editorials. One person likes joint, you know, New Year's speeches. But in, in general, there's, there's no, regardless of what is going on in North Korea, there's nothing there that has uh, a significant impact as far as the critical issues as far as denuclearization. If you look where North Korea is today on its denuclearization policy, it's largely cons cons consistent with what I call the strategic arc of their, of their longer term goals. And their long longer term goals were actually clarified in, in the proclamation of Byungjin policy last year. Because we always knew that North Korea eventually was hoping that the world would just simply be worn out, acknowledge, tolerate, just learn to live with a nuclear North Korea, and then it could begin to uh, recover its economy, restore some type of relations with the outside. In other words, have their weapons and have their economic development. Uh, that's been a longer term goal, and, and Byung-jin makes it clear. And I think going forward, uh, one would imagine that is what Kim Jong-un is shooting for as well. So recent developments, it's, uh, you know, speculating on those, I don't know, it'd be particularly helpful, particularly since we get into intelligence matters relatively quickly. Uh, but what is clear is that the po we see no policy changes so far. We see no policy changes. We'd love to see policy changes, but we haven't seen anything yet. Mm -hmm. Speaking of policy, I mean, how do you think we're doing with China right now? Well, you know, this, I think we've had some good cooperation with China. You know, we, we, we had senior level interaction with the Chinese at both Sunnylands and St. Petersburg last year. The vice president visited toward the end of the year, and, and China has made it repeatedly clear that it supports the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, that it supports uh, real negotiations that get us to denuclearization. Uh, they uh, see that the actions that North Korea takes uh, are destabilizing to the region, uh, are not in their own best interest. And so we've been able to make progress with, with uh, the People's Republic of China. We go, uh, Glenn Davies and I go out and engage with our PRC counterparts. There's a shared understanding of, of the, uh, the challenge posed by North Korea, a shared understanding of the urgency of the issue. So I think we've, we've uh, laid a foundation for cooperation going forward. I know that, uh, you know, people might say that we, you know, uh, that the United States expects too much out of China. And I can just say that we, we look forward to cooperating and working with China, but at the same time, uh, you know, we know that we will have to continue as we have over the past several years to take uh, actions uh, in our defense and the defense of our allies, like the Republic of Korea, 
in response to the growing North Korea nuclear threat. Okay. Now I know I know that you don't have a lot of time, so we'll open it up. We'll just take a couple of questions from the floor. Um, uh, yes. Hi, I'm Ching Yi Cheng uh, at Phoenix TV. Uh, just today, uh, China and ROK announced to build a defense hotline uh, as soon as possible. I'm just curious, uh, how does the U.S. And, or, or the White House see this latest development? Thank you. They have announced a what? The China ROK hotline? Well, you know, we, we certainly encourage cooperation and, and communication between all the, the parties in the region, anything that contributes to the reduction of tensions. Uh, and the ability to uh, to have that type of you know transparency, ready communications necessary to respond to the various contingencies in the region is positive. Yeah, there's no reason not to be positive about that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Katie Lee from. KBS, is there any plan for U.S. government officials to visit North Korea in near future? And then there are some negotiation under the table between the United States and North Korea uh, over the release of uh, Kenneth Bell. Uh, can you explain what is the condition from the North Korean government? for the release of Kenneth Bell? Well, that's a great <laughs> question. You should be asking probably to, to the North Koreans, though, at this point. <laughs> uh, let me just simply say this. The United States has made uh, significant efforts. The United States government has made significant e efforts over the past year since uh, Kenneth Bay was uh, detained, uh, uh, convicted, and imprisoned in North Korea. We've made a number of efforts, uh, sustained efforts, for his release. And uh, as you know, we have uh, sought to have our special envoy for human rights, Robert King, travel to Pyongyang so that he can go in and secure Kenneth Bay's release. Uh, you know, the North Koreans have, have not been responsive to those appeals over the course of the year. We continue to ask North Korea uh, for their, their pardon of Kenneth Bay, and we'll continue to work for it. I think anything beyond that, uh, you know, we have to wait and see. Uh, you know, the, the challenge, you know, with, with North Korea always is, uh, you know, when they publicly articulate a desire for dialogue and yet, you know, trying to sit down and have a, a conversation, a meaningful conversation, can, can at times be quite elusive. Uh, that doesn't deter us from continuing to seek uh, you know, robustly Kenneth Bay's release, and we hope that the indications uh, given by the uh, North Korea Central Television uh, case, uh, carrying the KCNA interview of Kenneth Bay over the weekend are, are an indication that North Korea is considering uh, uh, moving forward with a progress by which Kenneth Bay can be pardoned and returned. Uh, I think we can take one more. Hi, <coughs> Kim, Kim, Song Jin Kim, uh, CSIS uh, visiting fellow. Uh, you talked about the shared understanding with China about North Korea, and what is the, the exact and concrete shared understanding uh, with China? The, uh, the current you know, the execution of Jiang Song Tae and the recent you know, the Kim Jong Un regime's you know, development. That's my question. Why, well, you know, when I spoke about a shared understanding, I, I, I was talking primarily about the policy goals of establishing a denuclearized uh, Korea, you know, uh, Korea Peninsula that is marked by, by peace and stability, and, and hopefully one day prosperity for the people of North Korea uh, when they choose the right path, uh, the correct path of denuclearization, integration into the international community. Uh, not necessarily that, you know, we have a, a shared intelligence assessment of the situation in North Korea, but, you know, the, that shared policy goal, that shared outlook for the future of the Korean Peninsula, that shared emphasis on denuclearization 
is the basis upon which we can have a dialogue going forward and we can begin to work very closely on this difficult issue. Um, Sid, I personally know how many hours you put in in this job and how hard you work and I want to thank you for taking the time to come out and join us today in spite of the elements and uh, I wish you well. Thanks again. Thank Thanks. you, Victor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.